Today we have reached the climax of our nine days of devotion to Saint Anne. In the Gospel today we hear of the sower going out to sow seed and how some of that seed bears much fruit. We have been striving to make our hearts more and more like that good soil, that good soil that can bear a rich harvest. Elsewhere in the Gospels, our Lord says, many prophets and righteous people have longed to see what you see but did not see it, and to hear what you hear but did not hear it. For us, we can think of having the right soil for the faith to grow, but also these words today, which in some ways maybe speak especially to our patron, Saint Anne. Many prophets and righteous people have longed to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. This is true for Saint Anne, and also in our own ways today, in our own lives, it's true for us as well. There are blessings in our lives, things that we have received, that others wished, only wished that they could have received. And for us, we're so grateful to God for these graces, for these good things that he has granted to us. Catherine Emmerich, a visionary who received, uh, um, yeah, who had visions of the life of our Lord and, uh, and then also of Our Lady and a little bit with Saint Anne as well, um, shares with us a little bit of what she saw, what she saw from the life of Saint Anne. And these are private revelations, you don't have to believe them, but it's interesting just to reflect with her on, uh, on the life of Saint Anne and her connection to Mary and Jesus. At one moment, Catherine Emmerich, Emmerich recounts how Saint Anne visited the Holy Family in Bethlehem. And this is what she says. She says, today I saw Mary lay the infant in her mother's arms. Anna was greatly moved. Saint Anne being greatly moved at seeing our Lady holding Christ Jesus in her arms. And we can think about that. We can imagine that. And today, she goes on to say, another day, today I saw the Blessed Virgin once more in the cave of the Nativity and little Jesus once more in the crib. When Joseph and Mary are alone with the little child, I often see them adoring him. And now I see Anna, and the Blessed Virgin standing by the crib with bowed heads and gazing at the infant Jesus with great devotion. Blessed are Saint Anne's eyes, who quite likely was given this grace to be able to see the child Jesus after he was born. How blessed are her eyes and how blessed she was to be able to, to come and not only to see Jesus, but with Our Lady to adore him as she gazed in wonder at this great mystery of the god man here present in this little baby. In this last homily for our series on our church building, I am especially delighted to share with you today excerpts from the first homily that was preached at St. Anne's Church. Father Michael J. Klein of Holy Name Church in Toronto was invited by Father Engler to come and give the homily at the Mass of Dedication for this church, which was presided over by Archbishop McNeil of Toronto, as Hamilton's Bishop Dowling was, I guess, still ill. He was ill at the blessing of the cornerstone and still ill now. We are so lucky to have the words of, many words of the homily on that first day that people came to this new church to adore the Lord. These are some of the words in that homily that I wanna share with you today. The priest says, no doubt this building today stands for much in the life of this parish. It expresses the dignified grandeur of God's house. To you, this church will be the focus of religious life and the beautiful fountains of life and truth will be unsealed in this place. This beautiful church represents a vast outlay in material, workmanship, and money. 
Some might say that a simpler, less beautiful building would have served the same purpose. But for the ardent lovers of Jesus, generous giving is a great joy, and we don't count the cost. I love that, right? He says we could have gotten by the simpler building, but, but the ardent lovers of Jesus generous, are generous in, in, uh, in giving, and for them it is a great joy. They do not count the cost. True, the church would have cost less had the plans been less elaborate. We read in Shakespeare the story of Hamlet. He says he will remember the debt of his father, who was foully murdered. Shakespeare took that bold statement and, by his gift of artistry, transformed it into an, an imperishable passage. We regard the church as a jewel box, and the real presence of Christ belongs as much to it as to the Last Supper. Then he invested his apostles with his own eternal priesthood. He put them under orders to keep before the world the realism of his death by commemorating the Last Supper. There is a priesthood to take care of Calvary, to perform the same function he performed in the upper room. It is the Last Supper that keeps Calvary in constant operation. Had Christ not risen from the dead, we should have no Mass. But since he has arisen, he is still a living victim who can be offered again and again and accepted as sacrifice by Almighty God. The victim has already been slain, and that was a long while ago, you say, but that does not matter. The Mass continues in offering up the victim. The manner is not the same, but the priesthood, the offering and the object are the same. Each time we gather in the church to pray the Mass, we are transported to Calvary, we come before Jesus who becomes present in the bread and the wine becoming his body and blood. He is the victim, the victim which is sacrificed for our sake. That sacrifice is renewed each time we pray the Mass. That sacrifice is made present once again on the altar each time that we pray the Holy Mass. What an amazing thing. What a great mystery. He goes on, this place will remain hallowed. Looking at this church, I cannot help but think that Christ chose it as a place of sacrifice. I have nothing but words of praise for your heroic pastor for his great zeal. This temple is a tribute to his faith. Your faith breathes in every stone and brick of it. I congratulate the architect with the realization of his plans and the builders for the beautiful edifice they have erected to the glory of God. They finish the prayers of the mass and the consecration of the new church. And then later that evening, many came back. They couldn't stay away. Many came back for another service in the evening where they could gather to pray some more and this would be a, a special time of prayer as they would bring from the old church, the church you remember that they moved 40 feet, one foot a day for 40 days. From that church, they would bring the Blessed Sacrament in procession now to the new church, leaving behind the old and coming into their new home, their new spiritual home. That evening, Monsignor Kelly of the church in Dundas was given the honor of leading a rite to transfer the Blessed Sacrament from the old church to the new. A number of priests joined the procession, and in this case, along with a number of school children, some of whom the younger ones were dressed up as angels. At the conclusion of the solemn procession, Father William Benninger, a resurrectionist priest, they say delivered an impressive sermon. These are some of the words that he said. He said, as we left the old church tonight, bearing with us the blessed sacrament, 
the walls and the windows, the altar and the tabernacle seemed to cry out, why did you leave us? Did we not serve you well? But as we neared the door of the new church, the walls and the windows seemed to say in that old church, now we understand. We resign our keeping of you reluctantly, but gladly. And as we left the church and the new church seemed to sing out a joyous welcome. You are here, assembled under a roof that you have reared for God. You have built a temple wherein you may house your God and worship him in the sacrifice of the Holy Mass. Mass is celebrated at certain hours of the day, and we are obliged to attend Mass every Sunday. But our Lord is here on your altar, and if he leaves, it will be your fault, and I know that such a thing will never be the case. The altar is the inspiration for our faith. And he finishes, every time you visit the church, look to the altar and call to mind what it means to you. Dear good Saint Anne, you were given a special privilege to adore your newly born grandson, Jesus Christ, in Bethlehem. This little baby is at once your family and the Lord God himself coming to save his people. Saint Anne, help us to better appreciate the gift we have in seeing and adoring Christ in the Eucharist. Intercede for our church so that this building that was made for love of God and may bring us, that it may bring us to love the Mass and fervently adore Christ in the Eucharist even more.